go ahead and get started. We are so excited to have two of our very own uh, today presenting their work on higher education. Um, I will briefly uh, introduce Adela Solis. Uh, she's an assistant professor here in our department. Um, she came from Harvard Graduate School of Education, then worked at the Brookings Institute. Her work focuses on um, student success, factors that influence student success and access among uh, college, community college students. Um, and she was just awarded uh, no. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> For being recorded. <laughs> yeah. We're um, proud of girls. Say that. <laughs> um, I guess that's it. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> um, that was a great introduction. <laughs> um, so I think Will and I both really appreciate um, people coming out on Wednesday before spring break. I know everyone's tired. Um, so thank you. So this is very much a work in progress. Um, I think that we've sort of gotten into the habit and colloquium of presenting more finished products. Um, that is not what this is. Um, so I have a long to-do list, and I'm looking forward to the feedback that you're going to give me to add to that. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with comments, questions. Um, I actually prefer that it's a little bit more back and forth. Uh, so this is a project that's joint with um, a good friend of mine, uh, Zach Mabel, uh, who's a scholar and a gentleman and now resides at the college board. Um, and Jason Lee, I should have changed this, also a lovely person, um, formerly of THEC, now of TBR. Um, uh, I should also say that this project is part of uh, the Tennessee Pearl Research Lab. Um, that Carolyn has joint with um, Celeste and um, Bill at UT Knoxville. All right. So why focus on non-traditional college students? Uh, so a lot of uh, the students that are enrolled in higher education um, are actually adult students, um, so over 25. Uh, which to people that don't focus on higher education might not be um, perfectly intuitive. And also, um, these students tend to have uh, poor outcomes. Um, so graduation rates below 50%. And then for students who stop out, drop out, and then come back, the probability of finishing is even lower. <coughs> At the same time, um, the changing economy is making it very difficult for somebody without some type of credential to get a job. Um, and yet, our economy sort of needs uh, more educated people um, to fuel the workforce. So we've got this combination of the changing economy um, and poor college graduation rates. Tennessee, in particular, um, is very cognizant of this um, and is focusing some policy efforts at adults. Um, so this uh, project was actually a proposed to the state um, through this Research to Reconnect initiative because um, they did sort of some um, pre-research in-house and realized that they really don't know what's going on with their adult students, uh, what their outcomes are, but they have a lot of adult students um, and know that they need to focus on them um, if they want to grow the economy. <clears throat> so sort of ex-ante, I'm sort of regretting my animation. Um, <laughs> Um, ex ante, it's not really clear uh, sort of how financial aid will impact adult students. Um, so on the one hand, I think a lot of us in this room know there's a large body of literature that shows that um, financial aid can have a positive impact on college enrollment and persistence uh, for just kind of your typical college student. I shouldn't have said typical. I meant just traditional age college student. Um, uh, but that literature is focused on traditionally aged students. Um, and if you think about adult students, um, it's not clear that sort of the same um, effects will hold. Um, so on the one hand, a lot of adults say that they leave college um, because of affordability problems. Um, and you can sort of imagine a college student, an adult who has a lot of responsibilities, family responsibilities, credit constraints could be particularly um, constraining. Um, but at the same time, uh, Zach has a paper that shows that once students get really close to graduating, even if they lose their Pell Grants, 
this is adult students. Even if they lose their Pell Grants, it doesn't seem to impact their college graduation probabilities, um, which kind of suggests that maybe people's uh, decisions to persist, especially when they get really close to graduation, start to stabilize. Um, and then you could also sort of imagine sort of what I was saying before, the opposite being true, that if you have all these responsibilities, that just a little bit of tuition assistance, especially if you're not loan averse, is really not going to impact your um, choices about college. So there's a little bit of literature um, related to adults um, in college. Uh, so there's a paper by Sefter and Turner um, that estimates off of change in the amount of Pell Grant that you get uh, once you become an independent student. Um, and that shows that that sort of bump that you get when you're independent from your parents uh, increases college enrollment. Um, and then there's sort of mixed findings around persistence and completion. Um, uh, so let's see, this paper out of Texas um, uh, shows some positive impacts on graduation. Um, and they show, uh, sort of looking at mechanisms, that it's because, or they hypothesize that it's because students are um, participating less in term time employment, so they're not working while enrolled as much, um, and that's allowing them to um, get more credits. Um, and then Andrew Barr, um, looking at veterans, um, finds that uh, the GI Bill has a positive impact um, on college persistence and graduation, but not, interestingly, for students that are getting really close to graduation. So for students who are only um, getting the bill for a couple of years, because um, they sort of uh, are entering midstream and they only have a couple of years to graduation, um, there doesn't seem to be an impact for those students. Um, and then a paper that I just read a couple weeks ago, which is disturbingly similar to this paper that I'm presenting to you, um, um, by Oded Garantz. Uh, so Stanford graduate, lots of us in this room know him. Um, he's looking at the competitive Cal Grant, um, and he finds no impacts um, um, on getting this Cal Grant for adult students, um, except he's looking by sector, and he finds that it does increase the probability that students will enroll um, in the for-profit sector, graduate from the for-profit sector, I should say. Mm, like whether the treatment is kind of dollar amount or like a dummy variable. Um, as far as I've read them, um, it's more dummy variable. It's looking at aid or not aid rather than like dosage. Any other questions? So this Tennessee Hope for Non-Traditional Student Scholarship, um, that's the focus of this study. Um, it's pretty generous. Uh, those are the amounts um, for full-time equivalent semesters, um, and so it's covering uh, between 50 and 70 percent of tuition, depending on whether you're enrolled in the two-year or four-year sector. Um, but at the same time, um, it has some pretty um, heavy eligibility requirements. Um, of course, part of the idea is uh, to be focused on adult students, um, and another part of it, I think, is to have students who have um, sort of bought into the college experience, so not to be funding people who are sort of moonlighting for a semester, which we know uh, occurs a lot, especially in community colleges. Um, so students have to be 25 or older. Um, they have to be in a um, public institution in Tennessee. Uh, they have to have an adjusted gross income of below 36,000. Um, they have to have filed the FAFSA by a certain date. Um, and they have to have both attained a certain GPA, um, and that has to be at the end of a semester in which they've completed 12 credits. Um, so we're going to use that adjusted gross income um, as a running variable and an RD design. Um, and I'm not going to sort of do all of the um, um, tricks to show you that uh, we think that that is something that students are unaware of. Um, but I would just kind of say, I mean, sort of trying to affect your income, much less your adjusted gross income, is fairly implausible. Um, so I think it makes a pretty convincing running variable for the RD. Uh, so just some descriptive statistics. 
Um, I've withheld the name of the institutions um, to sort of protect their anonymity. Um, uh, but over there on your left, on your left, um, are public four-year institutions um, in the Tennessee system and on the right are community colleges. Um, and the dark bars are showing you the number of students who are eligible for the Hope for Non-Traditional Students Scholarship. And the lighter bars are showing you those that were actually awarded the scholarship. Um, so you can see that there's a really low take-up rate, um, which again sort of probably fits with our priors if you look at that list of um, eligibility criterion. Um, and then in school I, there's even a little bit of uh, non-compliance that you can see. Um, students are getting the scholarship uh, who aren't eligible, um, which bears out uh, in the data, of course. Carolyn, did you have a question? Well, I was just thinking about the systemic right that maybe you were talking about the Jesse Grossing thing. I'm assuming that it's verified and so that they wouldn't just be reporting a number that they want. Is that, can, do they know that? They verify the Jesse Grossing thing that's reported? I'm assuming so. We haven't called people to sort of talk about the application experience. I think that that would be. Um, no, it was in the state. This would be the state data, right? That they would either like, require you to submit like a copy of your. Like, mm, your FAFSA. They would, they would, you know, indicate they're going to verify to make sure people are still reporting three five nine five zero versus you know three seven. Right. Seven. Um, no, I would assume so. That's something you can easily verify, right? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Then your argument of not having to worry about checking the right. is, is stronger. <laughs> I mean, we did check. I'm just not going to show it to you. What's that? Are they pulling it from the FAFSA? Are they pulling it from the FAFSA? Yes. Uh, um, so I don't actually know like what the award process looks like. Okay. Um, so I don't know what THEC is doing. Right. I mean, that's kind of what I was assuming. But it's true that I haven't actually called anybody and asked them if that's what they're doing. Joe? The, the $36,000, um, if you're, say, 19, what, what do they count? Income? Do they count? If you're 19? Um, well, for this scholarship, you have to be 25 and older. So it would be their family, nothing to do with their parents. Um, right, them or possibly them and their spouse. The number is a little bit different if, they're, if you're married. So is this 33% eligibility, is this the eligibility based only on AGI, or is this eligibility based on all of the This is eligibility based on all the criterion. So why is take-up? Sorry, except for AGI. Why is take-up so <laughs> low? Wait, 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 what is it, what part you just said? Except for AGI. Um, sorry, you guys are making me fluster. Um, no. This is, even though I welcome questions, I love questions. Um, um, no, this is eligibility. Um, and then tabulated next to the people who actually were awarded the scholarship. So students who are 100% eligible based on all those criteria. All those criteria. Mm. Okay. So then why is take-up so, I don't understand that. Um, so I'm not actually surprised, right? Given that you have to be enrolled and you have to have a certain GPA and you have to have, it has to be this semester at the end of the first time you did 12 credits, I mean, you would then have to go apply, right? So you'd have to know that, um, that you had fulfilled all these criteria, you'd have to know that it exists. I'm assuming that the colleges. These aren't the people that fulfill that criteria, otherwise they wouldn't be eligible. Yeah, but they don't necessarily know that. So then it's entirely about awareness. Is That's my hypothesis. Okay. But these institutions have a big incentive, you would think, to get people to take it, to, to apply, but they just don't do it. Like, as far as you know, the, the institutions are not seeking out eligible people who could otherwise receive the grant and trying to push them. Right. I mean, why do you think that the institutions have an incentive to get people to apply? Well, presumably they would anticipate that getting the money would make it more likely that people persist and that they want So just tuition money. dollars? Yeah. Um, uh, given what I know about financial aid offices, which granted is not that much, um, I'm not at all surprised. Especially if you've got monster programs um, that you're competing with in the two-year sector, um, you're going to put, in my opinion, all your eggs in that basket. So what's going on with Community College I? Uh, Somebody is um, giving out awards when they shouldn't be. <laughs> so maybe they are recognizing the incentive that Jason just <laughs> described. <laughs> and they're um, fudging the numbers. 
Is this the same, does this operate the same way as like the traditional students of Tennessee Hope where it's like, it's just a last dollar scholarship? As far as I know, yeah. Okay. Anything else? So it's possible these people are funded 100% from other sources and therefore not actually eligible to receive it. Is the federal sources like hell are going to come first? Right. It is possible. Um, um, I need to double check that um, in the data. We do have um, the other, do we actually? We had an argument about um, which financial aid variables we could get. I think we ended up with um, things like Pell, possibly not the dollar amounts. I have to go back and check that. That is a possibility. I still don't think that that explains uh, such low take up. Yeah, I should. Other questions? Mm -hmm, Amanda? I was going to ask how much, um, just kind of with your hypothesis on how like financial aid offices might be working where the focus is, like what fraction of kind of the el kind of eligible for financial aid students do these students for this scholarship like represent, like what fraction? Of eligible for financial aid students. Um, can you rephrase your question? I'm not quite yeah, sure what you're so asking. Like, of all of the students that they have to consider in their workload, what uh, those who are qualified for the scholarship to, to I see what you're saying. Um, so I would sort of be more wondering what fraction of the dollars of aid they have to give out does this represent? Like after they've dealt with Promise and they've dealt with Pell, um, is this still sort of, you know, is there still both sizable need and is this a sizable pot such that they're sort of motivated to, for example, sort of try to get people to apply? <coughs> Um, is this putting pressure on the colleges to actually try to keep the students? Wasn't that long ago, K-12 at 40% not graduating and went into action to do a whole bunch of things to get it up. I mean, I feel like that's what Drive to 55 is. It is big policy effort to keep people enrolled. All right, moving right along. I'm not keeping track of time at all, are you guys? Okay. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have administrative data um, from the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, um, which consists of sort of what you would expect, um, enrollment files, term by term persistence files, uh, and financial aid files. Um, for this particular paper, right now at least, uh, we're looking between fall of 2010 and spring of 2017. Uh, we're running just a standard uh, regression discontinuity model um, in which we're regressing outcomes, which right now are just term-by-term uh, -term persistence, um, graduation with a credential, uh, different types of credentials, GPA, credit accumulation, uh, regressing that on our running variable and a dummy variable indicating students who are eligible, um, the interaction of those two variables, some covariates like gender, ethnicity, whether or not the student is married, um, fixed effects for institution where the student was when they um, attained eligibility. Uh, so we're looking at uh, beta 2, the coefficient on the dummy variable indicating eligibility. Uh, we're looking at a couple of bandwidths right now. It doesn't seem um, to really impact uh, the sort of confusing results that we have. Um, and of course, we did uh, the McCrary density test. <clears throat> so just first stage graphs. Um, it does look like there's dis a discontinuity, um, whether you're looking at age received um, or the um, fraction of people that were awarded uh, this scholarship. Uh, just some descriptive statistics. Um, so students um, across the cutoff, uh, if we're using the CCT bandwidth, um, look pretty similar, uh, which is uh, Never mind. Um, um, and then sort of some outcomes. Uh, so it looks like actually people who are ineligible um, have slightly more cumulative credits, uh, slightly higher GPAs. Um, so effects on graduation rate. Um, uh, so for students uh, earning a credential within four years of attaining eligibility, 
um, it looks like the probability of earning a credential um, increases by between 4.7 and 6.3 percentage points, um, which is about 10 or 13 percent um, above the baseline mean of 46 percent. Um, however, the sort of confusing thing right now um, is that we don't have intermediate outcomes, um, so you would expect uh, that credit or that graduation effect um, to sort of be um, um, for something to come before it, like credit accumulation, um, and we don't find that, um, nor, we do, nor do we find effects right now um, on term-to-term -term persistence. Um, so I like the idea of non-traditional hope. Um, I kind of like it better than free college. Um, it's more efficient, it's targeted, um, it could potentially incentivize um, the students who are going to stay if they're students who've already bought into college. Um, at the same time, we know from the research uh, that having these big obstacles um, to getting aid um, has a big impact on the probability that students will get aid and thus on its ability to actually help students. Um, so this study is contributing to a pretty small literature um, and those graduation effects, if they hold up, um, are similar in magnitude uh, to those reported by one of those three papers um, that I found that show impacts for adults of receiving financial aid. Um, though again, um, we're sort of still looking for mechanisms. Um, I think that hopefully merging our data in uh, to the bigger TLDS system um, so we can look at UI data, we'll be able to see impacts of receiving the aid on term time employment, um, uh, as well as looking at employment and quarterly wage outcomes. Um, and we're still working on this. As I said, it's a work in progress. Um, we're still playing with uh, specification of the models. Um, we're going to run IBI analysis and look at um, fuzzy RDs, um, but we're just kind of, uh, we're working on it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Brent? ODED finds nothing. So we clearly have some, like a noise problem. <coughs> Um, and his zeros are pretty precise. Hmm. Okay. Similar compliance levels? Uh, for the CalGrant, no, because that's automatic. automatic. Like, that's kind of something that um, if, as we work on this more, and I feel like this warrants policy recommendations, um, that's what I would say. Like, California, once you uh, sort of, once you're, you fulfilled the criterion, and the criterion are not as um, crazy as they are here, you just kind of, it clicks on. So people are getting it that, uh, that don't even know that they are getting it. Okay, so what does the application process look like? Um, that's kind of what you just asked me, and I'm not, sh I can't tell you the details about how they have to apply, but I will find out for you. So I have, I'm just curious, do you look at, is it possible to look at not, not these, but other effects? Like I'm thinking of the marriage. So if you were 32 and you're thinking of getting married and you were in this pool, you wouldn't get married, right? Because your income would go from whatever it is if you get over 36000 Oh, yeah. uh, to see if there's sort of perverse incentives yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that, that would at least, at least worth checking. I there's some items in there. Uh, we could check. I was just, we could check. Good. I'm so sorry I missed this. <clears throat> What's this, uh, the size of the, like the CCT or IK bandwidth, which is in dollar terms? Um, about 13,000. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I won't pretend this is a question. Um, but I'll just say, so on a paper that I, I did recently, the, um, the advice we got, which is really, really good advice, was just run the bandwidth, like run a lot of bandwidth and just plot how the estimate is sensitive to this. Leslie Turner did this in the, her palpable. Yeah. Paper. Um, and it tells you so much. So maybe just go like 500 or even $100 at a time and just run it out to from a, like crazy narrow to like the widest possible and see what happens to the estimates and the confidence intervals as you're running along. Um, um, that was on my list, because yeah. I've heard you give that advice to somebody okay, else so far. No problem with <laughs> And the, um, the, yeah, 13,000 seems just like substantively, like, 
big, right? Like, it just seems like really different people are gonna be between, if you're going, so it's, that's 23,000 to 39,000? That's pretty different. No, but bigger than that, 36, 49,000. All right. Yeah, it seems, I, I, I have a hard, the substantive, like the substantive bandwidths you get from these algorithms sometimes seem kind of questionable to me. Okay, I did march in, like start to march in a little bit, um, but it's true I haven't done it systematically and then plotted them or anything. Are you using linear predictions? Mm hmm Yeah, you can throw in like, you know, Higher order right, order right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I kind of think um, I didn't show you the um, the graphs um, with actual outcomes. They definitely suggest that that's what we should be doing. Some sort of mm -hmm. So, when a person you said I become eligible at the end of my first semester, in which you have uh, completed twelve credits and achieved a two point seven five. What I take away from your results is there's no impacts on continuous enrollment, but there is an impact on completion. Is it also the case that I am subsequently eligible whenever I come back? I mean, I will get the money whenever, whenever I, if I skip, I skip the next two semesters and I come back in three semesters, mm. will I automatically get the money because I was eligible at the end of that first semester? Or I don't think so. I have to be. It has to be at that semester. I think that's my understanding of what it says. That's interesting, because that's kind of, that is really puzzling, right? How many semesters do you get the local scholarship for? Um, uh, that is a good question. There is a limit. Um, I'm going to like guess it's like six, or you have gotten a certain amount of money. Um, is there an enrollment intensity effect? Have you checked it? Like Credits attempted. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. Uh, mm, yeah, there's nothing there. Part of the problem is um, those variables in our data um, are a little bit messed up. Um, but so, given what we have to work with, there's nothing there. Can, can you identify individual institutions in this? Uh huh. And can you pick the top five percent to keep kids, keep adults? Um, sort of look at which are, which are the best for adult students. Yes, and then, uh, and then figure out what they're doing. Um, I could, probably. Okay. Just curious. That's like what Well, that's what the school faculty do. That's what it's years. Um, I need a collaborator. An ethnographer, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else? Thank you for your feedback. Hi, everybody. So it's my honor to introduce our second speaker, our own acting director of graduate studies, <laughs> PhD holder in higher education administration, and master's holder in political science, to talk about democratization, diversion, and profit. Dr. Hi. So it occurred to me uh, as I was preparing for this that I have been, a, for many of the people in the audience, I have been through their work in excruciating detail, and now is finally their chance to do the same to me. So have at it. Like, Adela, please fluster me. Um, questions, uh, comments, criticisms, all the way through. So um, the, the, Big question that we had underlying uh, this research um, starts out, it's just really simple. Like, why would anyone attend a for-profit institution of higher education? All right, these institutions, so, and just like really quickly, so for-profits, like first definition, like they're for-profit, you know, they, they, uh, they make money uh, through educating students. They're eligible for federal financial aid. Uh, that's most of the way they make money. They, um, there's a, a requirement that institutions can't get more than 90% of their financial aid from federal financial aid. Most of these institutions run right up against that, that benchmark. They get, you know, 85, 90% of their revenue comes in the form of grants and loans, and mostly loans. Their business model is not what most people think. It's not just like online, like online education all the time. The way they make money, the way they're more profitable than like we are or like other institutions are, is that they centralize their curriculum. They have one way of teaching a class. 
and they take that class and they, everybody teaches exactly the same class and it's offered by somebody who's not a full-time faculty member but comes in from the community with some level of expertise. So you take a management class from somebody in the community who's like currently, who typically has got like an MBA and is doing some management themselves. And they teach for very low wages. You know, so they'll, they'll be paid $2,000, $2,500 for a class. So that's just way less expensive. They never do, the faculty who teach never do curriculum development, they never develop a syllabus, they never develop an assignment, lots of times they don't grade assignments. Everything's centralized. And so it's, uh, the, by doing that, they become much, much more profitable. They cost about $14,000 on average per year, um, less than a place like this, obviously, but a little bit more than the $3,600 it would cost to go to a community college for most of the time, exactly the same degree. So, um, why, you know, the, the, this, uh, the question, you know, kind of why would anybody go? Um, um, and if we look at this, so I've got data, we're going to be using data from this, um, from the Educational Longitudinal Study of 2002, and we're going to the third follow-up from 2012. Each of these bars, sorry, the uh, video is not quite at the level I'd like, but um, each of these bars represents a different group of students who had different post-secondary experiences. So I'll read them off. The colors will stay consistent. So these are the hourly wages of people who never attended higher education. So we start with high school sophomores in 2002, check in with it, them again in 2012 and ask them what were your hourly wages. The people who just never attended college had hourly wages of about $13 an, an hour on average. Um, and then the people whose first college was a for-profit make about a dollar an hour more than somebody who never attended higher education. Somebody who attended a for-profit at any point during their post-secondary careers, if they, they came into a contact for a single class with a for-profit institution, again, about a dollar more than the people whose first college was, any attendance um, uh, over here, their average wages are more like $17 an hour. Um, and then um, the, uh, if your first college was a non-profit, that's the highest amount. And if you just never had any contact at all with a for-profit institution, those are the people with the highest wages. So it just kind of goes in lockstep. The more kind of exposure you had to a for-profit institution, the lower your wages are likely to be. And we can do that for other outcomes. If it, so that's just wages. Um, but if we take a look at that and look at certificates. So um, certificates are these kind of short-term um, certificates that you can get in specific fields. Think like information technology, um, things like that. Um, the, your probability of getting a certificate or better actually increases um, the, to, the, like, to the degree that you weren't exposed to a for-profit. And these are like a particular area of specialty of for-profits, but only about 50% of the people who attended these institutions ended up with a certificate. And then if we go to higher degree levels, if we look at things like associate's degrees, um, if you attended a four, if your first college was a for-profit, you have a, about a one in three chance of ever getting an associate's degree. And if you ever attended, if it, a student ever attended a for-profit, they've got about a 35% chance of, of getting an associate's degree. Um, and then you can see, you know, the, the overall rates run more um, in the range of about 50%, please. What oh, sorry. Data the Educational Longitudinal Study of 2002. So nationally representative sample. Nothing, just raw data. Yep. Please. So uh, predominantly um, uh, associates and sub associates awards. It's uh, there are the four, uh, four year uh, for profit attendance has been the fastest increasing over the last few years, but it's still a very small share of the market. It's mostly vocationally oriented certificates and associates degrees, like um, home health aid um, is a big one. Does that help? Yeah. Um, and then for bachelor's degrees, it just you know kind of we continue the pattern. It gets even worse. Your probability of getting a bachelor's degree. If your first college was a for-profit, it's about 10%. If, you, if the student ever attended a, a for-profit, it's about 17%. So um, pretty remarkably bad. Um, and so if you uh, confront for-profit leaders with this evidence, which happens all the time, that, you know, um, they'll say, you don't get it, right? This, like, yes, we acknowledge that it looks like this, 
But here's what we do. We take students that wouldn't be able to enroll otherwise. There's no other options for these students. And um, if a, a student comes to us, they're actually much more likely to complete uh, than if they attended a community college. Com community college completion rates are very low. Uh, and they say, no, we're better. We're both better at getting students through and completing. We're customer oriented. Uh, and uh, we're more market oriented. We have better career placement uh, and are able to kind of, uh, uh, get people into more meaningful careers than if you went and attended, um, uh, they went and attended a community college. That's their argument. It's entirely a selection story. They think that the, their relevant counterfactual, the group that they should be compared to, is no attendance at all. Um, and so and they say, and then even among the students who might, that like, they, they just tend to get students who are not particularly well prepared for higher education. And with the students they have, they say they do a remarkably good job. And I've seen them kind of lobby uh, state policymakers. The other part of this argument that isn't part of this discussion is they'll say, oh, and by the way, all of your other institutions of higher education cost you tax money, we pay you taxes, right? We are, we're for-profits, we're tax-paying organizations, um, and so opening up access to our, our institutions, you know, making sure that your students can attend them, that's like, the, you know, I've seen, heard them say this, like the, the most cost-effective way you could uh, achieve your educational goals. Okay. Um, so, and that is, in fact, the exact line that the Trump administration has taken. Um, the, to the extent that the Trump administration has any post-secondary policy at all, it's favoring the expansion of for-profit colleges and deregulating them extensively. So a lot of the, the uh, labor market um, uh, restrictions, particularly around the accumulation of loan debt that have been in place to keep community colleges eventually from getting students to rack up a bunch of debt and then not get jobs, have been uh, rescinded and worked back and continually kind of undermined uh, by the current Department of Education. So there's a big push. Um, based on this argument, the you know, argument, the kind of the selection argument, um, that uh, you know, uh, uh, from the current administration. So it seems worth kind of taking their argument on its merits, right? Um, if we look at the <coughs> how students who go to a community college fare compared to other relevant groups and also try and solve that selection problem. We know that they're really different. A student who starts at a, a, a community college or a four-year college is likely going to be very, very different than a student who starts at a for-profit institution. Um, but if we can make some distance towards solving that selection problem, get the comparison between similar groups of students, that's going to be important. That'll give us a, a really important evidence uh, about whether or not these institutions are indeed as bad as they say. So to skip to the end, uh, just really quickly, spoiler alert, they're way worse than this. Like our estimates show that the negative impacts are considerably worse than you see in the raw data. Okay, on that happy note, <laughs> any questions or anything so far? Please go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, Walk me through the logic. Well, so the argument was these for-profit institutions are getting students who wouldn't have enrolled otherwise. So they have unobservables or observables that would or make them worse, quote unquote, in terms of the outcomes you're looking at. Yeah. Completion or whatever. Right. If the results are what you said, then wouldn't that have to imply that it's actually the opposite story? The for-profits are getting students that are better. That's right. And when you see, then the identification strategy is going to be based on the proximity to for-profit colleges. And so basically, they're drawing in a whole bunch of students who would be better off had they attended a community college. They're in the, in these, the, the local average treatment effect is based on these students who are being pulled in, who, yeah, they're, they're like being, they're better off um, in a different spot. I'm not sure that they're better off, but they're better than the average student. They're better, that's right. That's right. They would, they're, they're higher, the, the ones that are being pulled in and that are, um, uh, yeah, better than the, the average for that, that group. That's right, yeah. Uh, well, what percent of the people who don't come back, don't come back because they didn't do well? Almost none, surprisingly. Um, flunking out of higher education is this exceedingly rare event. Um, the, it, like, why people leave is this question we puzzle over all the, all the time. Um, the, 
there, there may be like an anticipatory thing that it's just they, they feel they can't go any further. They kind of got as far as they could right now. But like literally like going on academic probation and then the next semester like having gone through academic proba probation for another semester getting kicked out of an institution of higher education is an exceedingly rare event. Um, you said earlier that um, for-profits say that people feel that this is the only option that they have. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the best work on this is Constance Elo, um, who's done a lot of work on um, uh, 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 ethnographic and qualitative work on um, how students choose to attend a for-profit institution. And so lots of times, if you ever, like, you can go right now if you have a laptop. If you go to any of the major for-profit institutions' websites, um, you can't log in until you give them their co your contact information. Um, they're going to say, hey, welcome to the website. Uh, can you just give it, tell us a little bit about yourself? As soon as you do, they will contact you, no joke, every day for the next month. Um, and so, and these, these institutions are very aggressive about recruitment efforts. Um, they may be the only institution that the student has, like literally the only institution the student has heard of. So you're graduating from high school, you kind of heard that like, you know, people are going to college, but they own like, you've, if, the, if, if you have become a marketing target for these institutions, they will make sure you know about them, they'll make sure that you, you know you can get all this financial aid, you don't have to pay anything because you borrow the money. Um, but the, the choice set for lots of I students choosing for-profit institutions is one institution, and it's that institution. Okay, so it's not like they're ineligible for other institutions. Most community college systems are open to anyone who can benefit. Okay. So if you're 18 years old and you can benefit from instruction, you can go. Okay, so now you might, you're going to get into developmental education. There's a whole bunch of other things that happen after that, but just plain old access, yeah, most community colleges are going to be open. They're not going to be selective. Yeah, and it's, you know, and they've, they've been uh, targeted by pretty sophisticated marketing that says you will get a job in this field that pays this um, if you come here. My only experience with for-profits is my husband used to work at a for-profit uh, nursing college. Um, so in that case, they couldn't get into the community colleges because nursing is such a selective program. Oh, right, college. so you can have, right. So then they went to that program. So the, the quality is assured by accreditation, right? And what accreditors look for is a bunch of process indicators. Um, they're going to, um, what's the, you know, how, much, how many student contact hours are there? What are the nature of the facilities? Um, we don't, and like, we're subject to this, like, as, an, as a, you know, a selective, not-for-profit uh, institution, we're, we're subject to this too, but like, there's no like, quality measure of higher education that determines whether or not you can uh, be an operating concern. It's just a pro set of process measures, and they meet those process measures by like one cent, right? They will do exactly what accreditation tells them to do and nothing more. Do they need the accreditation to what? Oh, absolutely. So they need the accreditation to get Title IV funding from the federal government, to get the grants and loans from the federal government. The, one of the best studies on this was by Stephanie Cellini. She looked at, in some, some states will authorize some programs to be like post-secondary institutions and others not. So you could have the same, exactly the same thing being taught in one state and then in the neighboring state. They teach that too, but in, in state A, that's a college, and in state B, it's just a proprietary institution. It's not a college. The difference in tuition between state A and state B is exactly the amount of federal financial aid that students are eligible for in state A. They capture all of the excess in the form of getting money from the federal government. These are basic, like the one way of looking at these places is just like federally sponsored. These, this is our federal system of higher education. They, they run off of federal funds. Okay. So, um, this, and so this actually, the, the reason for this title, this reminded us of a really similar debate actually about community colleges, because community colleges have low um, success rates. And uh, the, the question around community colleges is, yes, uh, if a student starts at a community college, they seem less likely to uh, get a degree, like say get a bachelor's degree eventually, but community colleges are so much more open. So they democratize higher education by bringing in a bunch of students who wouldn't other otherwise go. But community colleges almost certainly divert a number of students who could have gone further. If they hadn't started at a community college, they probably could have started at a four-year college and kind of done better. 
So it's a similar set of questions for the for-profit institutions. They, um, they, you know, they're open to everybody, and so they may democratize higher education by bringing in more people, but there's going to be a certain set of people that are going to be diverted from their degrees. So we're going to look at both of those questions. Let me I'll pull up my slides. I'll talk about the questions really quick. All right, time to critique my research questions. Um, so the, the first, you know, just like if you, and what we're going to use, this is going to be focused uh, really closely on this idea that people who live, more clo live closer to more uh, for-profit institutions are going to be more likely to attend. And we're taking this as a, an instance of availability bias. You say, well, I, I want to go to college. Somebody who lives closer to a lot more for-profit uh, institutions of higher education, we think is going to be a lot, a lot more likely to go, just having been more exposed, more aware um, that these exist. Yeah, I was hoping that I could get a little bit further before uh, we got there. So um, the, the two, there's two arguments here, right? Um, one is that this, though our data are for students who were first um, getting into post-secondary education around 2004. At that time, online was still a really small sm a share of the market. Um, like pure online was like 5% at the time. Uh, mixed kind of like online and in-person was about 15%. And remember, and even for the for-profits, it wasn't, and particularly in 2004, it wasn't the bulk of their instruction. It was the bulk of their instruction was still in-person. Okay, so that's argument A. Uh, so what you think about that? And then argument B is, even if the student is attending online, and they're attending online in an institution that might be very, very far away, we think it's more likely that a student's going to attend a for-profit institution if they're actually living closer to more. So if you've been on public transport in almost any major city recently, almost every ad or every other ad is going to be an ad for a for-profit institution of higher education. There's just way more exposure to these types of institutions if you live closer to more of them. That's what we got. OK, yeah. Or are you agnostic? So uh, we actually think it's going to be more. We think it's going to be that there will be an increase. Sorry, what I meant was the, the direction of causality. Oh, no, we're agnostic. It's, that's, um, uh, that's purely, the first question is purely descriptive. Could you get around these two questions of, of like the direction of causality and the presence of like online institutions by looking at, at say, distance to a two-year institution? Because those, you know, if you think, if you're concerned about pro for-profit institutions like strategically locating in places where people are likely to be doomed or brought right. together. <laughs> <laughs> but an issue with two-year colleges, which are often been in place for many years, the states are funding them. And it's a substitute. Adele has done great work on this, looking at the, the extent to which the, as the for-profits move in, are they displacing, um, tell me if I'm getting this right, that they're displacing the, um, the existing community college enrollment and so on. So I'll, just, I'll skip to what um, we have on that, that first question, because I think it's the easiest way uh, to answer this. Um, so uh, we have, let me, step, let me go back, and then I'll, I promise I'll answer your question. Um, so uh, let's see, what do I want to do? Um, let's do the log inverse distance and then, all right. So our measure, so the measure that we're going to use of how close you live to how many colleges, so like using geographic variation to, to do this, to figure out where, where somebody's more likely to go is pretty old in, in the higher education literature. The first person to do it was Card. Um, and he just said, do you live in a county that has a public four-year institution? It's just a binary variable for a student. Do they live in a county with a public four-year institution? And then he used that to identify the relationship between college attendance and income. So, and then there's been more, kind of more recent efforts. Nick Hillman's been associated with this idea of living in college deserts. And so that's not a county, but like a commuting zone. And do, is, there, is there any college at all in the commuting zone you live in? And so on. So the... Our basic kind of uh, uh, take on this is that it's got to be a continuous measure, right? You're, the degree to which you live close to a given institution of higher education, um, it's not just one institution, it's how close do you live to how many, 
right? It's, and people, the idea being people who live closer to more community colleges or more public four years or whatever are probably going to be more likely to attend those types of institutions. So, you know, growing up in California, I could ride my bike to like four community colleges pretty easily, right? Um, and lots of people, and then, you know, the, in all of the Philadelphia area, as you, you know, you go 20 mile radius outside of Philadelphia, there's one community college, which is ridiculous. Um, so just, uh, there's really different levels, we think, of kind of exposure to this. So the way we do it is we look for every county in the U.S., we look at the population center of that county, like where do most of the people live, and then we measure the distance from that population center to every single, every single institution of higher education in the U.S. So we have this, so like for that county, you can picture there's like a list of distances to institutions. We can cut that list by different types of institutions. So we're going to be focusing on the for-profits. So that list gets cut down to what's the distance from this county to all of those for-profit institutions. Uh, we add that up. We take the log of the, the, um, the distances because we want uh, colleges that are closer to kind of count for more and um, colleges that are further away to count for less. And then we take the, and we go the inverse of it. And the, the net result of that measure, so it's, um, you can say it's the, the inverse of these, the sum of distances from that county center to all of these colleges. The net result of that measure for every county is that counties that are closer to more of a type of college are going to rate higher on our measure, and counties that are further from a given type of college are going to rate lower on our measure. Go ahead. Right. Versus two institutions that are the same distance away, but are really 200. Smaller. Right. This model, uh, it would be much greater for those two institutions because you're not factoring in the size. Is that right? Yeah, so we've done this in other work where we were looking just at, it was actually more around um, the uh, presence of community colleges. It might be different for for profits, but we were using community colleges. And the two things we thought were relevant were absolutely size and cost. Do you live close to a bunch of big colleges? That's, and so we had a measure that weighted based on size. And we had another measure that weighted based on cost. Do you live close to a bunch of low cost colleges, thinking that would be an additional factor that might induce more enrollment? We didn't find big differences. It was just like how many you lived, how close to. Now we haven't done the same thing for this study, kind of carrying, we just kind of carried over from the previous one thought maybe it didn't matter. Um, but yeah, it could be if you, you know, maybe, and for profits can be very, very small. So yeah, the enrollment weighting could be an important part of this. But they also don't have the capacity constraints that a community college has. So they can enroll and expand quickly. And the national ones are built to scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll never hear from them, oh yeah, you're not, you can't get into that section. Like they will create a section, yeah. yeah. So this is a, a tough one. Um, it has to be uh, in the way that the federal government would understand a campus location to be. Um, so most of the time, so the University of Phoenix has all of these locations. You drive by one on the way out to the airport. That counts. Um, but the, what wouldn't count is if there was effectively like a, a, like a distributed set almost of like of offices in a local area. We can only, we only see like the main one. Most of the time, those are going to be kind of in dense urban areas. Um, it's, you're not going to get like a branch campus that's going to be 100 miles away, like a, a branch that we can't measure that's 100 miles away from the main one. So again, we've, I have arguments. <laughs> Brent. I have a semantic quibble. Okay. Presence, right? yeah. Because if there's one, there are open access, there's access. Right. Right? Um, yeah. And you're thinking about it more of like a measure of its impact and influence by your awareness of how many are around. So we've bounced around on terms of this, and I appreciate that. So like geographic opportunity, like its proximity, like density, yeah. it's those kinds of, yeah. Please, Matthew. Okay. So related to Brent's point, I think you're actually talking about availability. Availability, yeah. Um, and that's actually an important distinction at least with respect to law, if, to the extent that you're ever going to get back to this, I know you're waiting for that, um, to the extent that you ever get back to this with federal funding. Um, availability is really, really difficult in law to try to see if, you know, there, there either are or there aren't, and there are very few instances where there aren't actual educational 
um, opportunities available. Mm -hmm. If you are actually measuring distance to an educational opportunity and it's in terms of availability and you think that that is the, the story that you're telling here, that is actually more compelling as an availability story okay. than an access story because access is kind of just whatever. Right. But if, you're, if you don't have opportunities that are made available and these four profits are now standing in the gap, it makes it harder for the, the nonprofit institutions to try to kick the four profits out. Right. I appreciate that. That's, yeah. Thank you both. Um, so let me show you what this looks like. So let's see, we've got... Let's see if we can draw this again. Oh, it was working a second ago. It's working like... Let's see if we can do this, hold on. Any time would be fine. There we go. So this is the distance for every county to all four profits. And so we've scaled this just on a Z scale. Um, most maps of college density in the US look something like this. That's because most of the people in the US live in the Northeast Quarter and they're kind of in the Rust Belt. And so that's where most institutions of higher education happen to be. Um, if we kind of scroll in and just look at some of the areas that show particularly high density, so, um, like Cook County is like a, at a one, you know, on the, the a standardized scale uh, for us. Um, if you go over to New York City, that's you know going to be one of the more dense areas. That's or kind of the area, you know, the tri-state area around New York City. It's a really, really dense area in terms of these institutions. Again, on our scale, um, our Z scale, um, uh, about a two. Um, if we flip over and look, instead of looking at all for-profits, we just look at in-state for-profits. Now, and in-state, many of the for-profit institutions, are, um, the students who attend are eligible for the state financial aid. It's not universal, but it is there, and there are um, uh, kind of differing amounts. If we limited the, the set of institutions that we're looking, to, looking at at just in-state institutions, you get a different picture of this. So here, um, uh, California, Texas, um, stand out. So like LA County in particular stands out as like being really, really high on this measure, real high density of in-state for-profit uh, institutions for the students who, who live there. Um, all of Texas and particularly um, East Texas and the kind of Houston, uh, San Antonio, Dallas triangle there um, uh, have a, a higher uh, a concentration of for-profits than is typical around the country. And then just one other region to kind of point out. Um, and then Pennsylvania as another state that has an unusually high density of these for-profit institutions. Okay, I have a bunch of these, but we don't have time. So um, I'll post the link. Okay, questions about that, the measure, the measure of availability, which I'm gonna steal and use exclusively from now on. Yeah. So we're going to do this a couple of day, ways. We're mostly going to, we're going to rely on, so we've got for every student in our sample, we can associate this measure of availability with that particular student. So how close do you live to how many? And we're going to do it two ways that I just showed you. One is how close do you live to how many in-state for-profit institutions? How close do you live to how many uh, of any type, uh, like kind of across the country, for-profit institutions? But you're not going to like, I mean, I'm, it, it, speaking on that first map, it just looks like that's all by region. And so how are you going to, like... It's not, it's a little bit by region, but there's substantial amounts of variation within the region, and it kind of varies within states. Yeah, it's, but it is, it's just plain true that the people who live in those areas live closer to more of these types of institutions. Right, you're be comparing a student in the Northeast to a student in That's right. the Midwest or somewhere else. That's right, that, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the subject, you know, that's a more, more fine-grained than that, but not as fine-grained as I'd like, yeah, but it's not strictly, it's not like just pure regional. There is variation within the regions, yeah. So the borders between states and within states between counties are artificial. Right. Um, but they seem to have some explanatory power here. Could you explain and talk about that? Well, that's by definition for this one. We limited the, the, the pool to just the in-state colleges. For the other one, um, it's... A little bit going to be, it's kind of got to be this mix of state policy. Let's look at this the other way. Um, 
this mix of state policy. Different states are going to be more or less welcoming to the uh, uh, for-profit institutions. And then just what the, you know, these institutions are different um, in that they're, you know, they're uh, going to be more market-oriented, looking, you know, more closely at areas um, where they think they can be competitive. So yes? Look at how the colors change between those two maps. That maybe these ones that aren't in state are more likely to be these like national online ones, and that they're going after these less densely populated areas. I'm just thinking about like for, for providers, you know, would there, I mean, I've seen, you know, education providers in different markets and for profit, they, they compete intensely on market share. Yeah. So, in order for their model to work, which is all based on efficiency, right, they have right. lots of students in. So I'm trying to think of like so if you would you would not want to, you know, dump yourself in the middle of the country or in less populated areas if you were looking to get people coming physically to your institution, but you could take advantage of the fact that providers can afford to set up, you know, physical shops in places where it's less dense densely populated, these could be more online ones that are absolutely so. and that's been the big push they have become much more sophisticated about that in since the time so this is you know, around 2004 and um, they've become much more sophisticated since then about um, uh, trying to tar target like individual regions and broadening the reach okay please can they, can they get credit for working I'm just trying to oh so the yeah, competency-based assessment so the for-profits would love to do this because, boy, that's efficient, right? Uh, you never have to teach a class. You can just say, hey, you're really good at this. You get a certificate. Um, but the, on the flip side is, like, holding a whole bunch of people in classes to do stuff they already know how to do is not a great function for any institution of higher education. Um, so there's a big push for competency-based competency education both at the state and federal level. It's driven both by kind of well-meaning people who want to make the system more efficient and also the for-profit providers. This, the problem is our system, we have no idea how to organize a system around competency-based education because we base everything on seat time. You get financial aid because you, were in, you took a certain number of credits. You're eligible for the financial aid program because you took 12 credits. Competency-based, I don't know how to organize a, a system of finance around competency. Oh yeah, uh, and that's, that's what we worry about. Um, but they, they're not allowed to right now, but they, they, they want to. Okay, so let's look at just in descriptively, if you, by these, the, the measures that we're, we're, I've talked about. So on top there is a measure, um, the log inverse distance to all uh, for profits right here. Um, and this is just a, a student's probability um, of enrolling at all. So does it, you know, how much does it increase the, the probability of enrolling as a function of that measure? So on the left, it's just a linear probability model. We have all institutions and we have in-state institutions, um, uh, for-profits on top, public two years underneath. Um, if you uh, live uh, uh, closer, um, uh, you are more likely to attend. Um, that's even controlling for whether or not you live closer to more two-year institutions. Um, for the in-state institutions, it's not statistically significant, but it flips around, and your distance to in, uh, public two-year institutions is statistically significant. So if you look at the in-state column, basically what it shows there is, if, we're, if you're talking about in-state institutions, which is probably the right comparison, because most people don't attend a community college out of state, um, if you live closer to more community colleges, you're substantially more likely to attend. Uh, if you live closer to more for-profits, it makes, there's no observable difference. It's not a statistically significant difference. So are they opening up you know, access more than, you know, we're controlling for the availability of community colleges. Are they doing more than community colleges? We see no evidence of a democratization effect. We don't see, if it was uh, an additional effect, we should see a positive impact on both of these coefficients. And we're not really seeing that. Okay, questions about this? Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about, Let's talk about counterfactuals. <laughs> okay, so to do this, to figure out the, the, the causal aspect of this, we need an identification strategy. Um, 
that uh, 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 takes care of this, this selection problem, but we have a whole bunch of problems in addition to our identification strategy. So first is, what should the treatment be? Um, should it be whether or not you ever attended a for-profit or whether your first college was a for-profit institution? Typically, in higher education, we kind of look at the first institution as particularly important, and we focus a lot of research on that. Um, but it's not clear whether, which of these are kind of the, the treatment that we're thinking about. Um, and then the counterfactuals, who, who should people be compared to? Should, we be compa should the students who attend a for-profit institution be compared to students who didn't attend at all, students who attended a community college, students who attended any institution of higher education uh, at all? So we're going to do all of it. Um, we're going to uh, run through the two different treatments and the different counterfactuals. Our identification strategy is based on um, this, uh, the, the, the availability of for-profit institutions. So what we're saying is um, we think that people who live closer to more for-profit institutions are going to be more likely to attend. That attendance is going to have some impact on your eventual outcomes, associate's degree completion, BA co degree completion, certificate completion. And this is the important part that I have to convince you of then there's no other mechanism by which those for-profits affect, the availability of those for-profits affects that outcome. The only way the availability of those for-profits affect these outcomes is through attendance at a for-profit. There's no other channel that kind of works through that. So, um, the, you know, the, the idea would be, and the, the, particularly with location-based stuff, you worry that people choose a location because of what's there. People choose where to live based on the schools, the K-12 schools. Like, absolutely. Like, there's no doubt. Do people choose where to live based on the availability of, like, higher education? Um, so one question for you is, uh, what's the second closest community college to us? We're, like, we're a room of experts. We know more. Uh, <laughs> what is the second closest community college? Actually, I'm worried oh. about the other way around. Okay. Well. Right. So like, I'd be worried that, you know, they're trying to steal, like in Chicago, for instance, right. like, there's a large city, I can steal just like 1% of that market share and still make a nice profit. So yeah, that's the, the more relevant concern that I was hoping to like have a really convincing argument on the first one and then <laughs> you go to the second one. But yeah, that's a, it's a, it is a concern. Um, to what extent is it, are these institutions selecting, you know, um, and it's, do they develop a third channel by virtue of being in places where people who have lots of other, would that be right, lots of other risk factors would, would also be present at the same time. And so what we're picking up is, you know, there would be, there would, the, the third channel would be this, the, it would, but it's the action of the for-profits choosing uh, students. And I think that's a live risk. Like, I, I honestly don't have a great counter argument for that. Let me take the bait on the first point, right? Okay. Think about metro regions that cross state lines, there is this sort of movement. Right, so people are gonna to choose to say live in Virginia and not DC, so they have access to the Virginia Community College System. Yeah. University District of Columbia or something like that. I yeah. actually do think there is some thought to that process around metro regions around yeah, it's a little bit, it's like m most of the time when you ask people even the most basic questions about costs, the type of institutions that are close by, even the distinction between a community college and a for-profit and a not-for-profit, they don't know. Like the, the, not, like the overall level, like highly educated, you know, parents, you know, like higher, highly educated upper middle income parents, sure, but like the population as a whole, like I'm, I'm skeptical. Thinking about Chicago's community college system, remember, I don't think this number has changed a lot um, from when I was looking at it some years ago, but it was like 93% of all the kids that went to community college stuff were told they had to do remedial, right? So one way to siphon off that, that um, group is to say, oh, no, we get you right into training, we're not going to make you do this. But then, without the remedial, it's hard for them to be successful. With oh, absolutely, it. right. And, part, but I mean the remedial part by um, having somebody go out to the workforce and do something and give them their degree? At a community college? No. No, it's Can't. taking a no. course that is like a You have to take it like a high school you class. Can yeah. you get into this course for this program you want until you do this training to get you up to this? So, I, 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 I have decided that I've completely convinced you on every point and we're ready to move on. Um, but we've got it, so the, the two things we're worried about, just to remind you though, is the first thing is, is there a sufficiently strong relationship between availability and attendance? And then we're gonna use that in the two-stage least square setup to say, well, 
people who live closer to more of these institutions are kind of like effectively randomly assigned to just being closer to more of these, these for-profits. They're, they just, it's not, you know, pure random assignment, but there's just a little bit of extra uh, uh, probability that they're going to attend a for-profit as a result of living close to one. And that's going to give us enough randomness that we can then say, for those people who are induced to attend a for-profit institution, what's the, the impact, by virtue of living closer to them, what's the impact of that on these eventual outcomes that we're interested in. Uh, so that's this local average treatment effect, which is just for the people who like went to a for-profit because they were living closer to them, um, uh, what happened to them compared to the relevant counterfactual. So this is the first stage. Um, we've got the log inverse distance measure up top, and then we're gonna, we interact that with an education indicator. We actually have like <laughs> layers of complexity in this paper. We're using multiple different um, uh, uh, indicators of parents' education, because it's not clear exactly which one to use. It, does the mother have some uh, college education? It's actually re the, uh, the reverse. It's the mother has no college education whatsoever. The father has no college whatso education whatsoever. And, or the parents have no college education whatsoever. So it's a binary variable, and it means they didn't, um, uh, uh, they've just like never attended college at all. Uh, and so we interact that with this log inverse distance measure. Um, uh, this is kind of common in the literature, but the idea is basically that people with low levels of resources who know less about college are going to be more impacted by availability. It has a stronger impact for those individuals. So the things to notice, it's a, the uh, coefficients are highly statistically significant regardless of the specification, um, in-state, all-for-profits. This first stage F says for these variables as a whole, um, how good are they at predicting whether or not somebody's going to attend a for-profit? And the idea is if we took them out of the model, what would be the reduction in model fit as a result? The rule of thumb is that that should be bigger than 10. The better way to do it is to use the stock and yogo, um, the minimum eigenvalue. Um, but the, with the exception of the one specification, all for profits, uh, mother's education, we exceed the, the uh, critical values for these in all of our specifications. There is a strong relationship between living close to a for profit um, and uh, the probability of attendance. So that's our first stage. And then um, the second stage here, so what we've got is. Um, just in OLS, we have a, a, a standard set of controls, um, uh, uh, race and gender and um, uh, high school performance. Like, so we have like this kind of long list of controls. I'm happy to read them off to you um, if you're interested in them. But in the OLS, um, this is the probability of getting a certificate if you attended a for-profit. So that 0 .088 means you're 8.8% .8 more likely to get a certificate if you attended a for-profit. Um, than if you attended a community college, all right? And so, and controlling for a, a host of other characteristics. Um, and then with the, the rest of these, um, these are the estimates from, in the middle column, from an augverse, in, uh, augmented inverse probability weighting, essentially like a version of propensity score matching. So we've got uh, similar distributions of covariates in the treatment and control groups. And then in the third column are our instrumental variables estimates. So this is the impact for people who are induced to attend a for-profit institution by virtue of the availability. Um, this is our local average treatment effect for those individuals. So for certificates, as we kind of read down here, none of these um, are statistically significant. In many, most of the cases, in fact, the standard error is bigger than the estimate. It's really centered right on zero. So the way to interpret that is people who, attend, uh, who attended a for-profit because they lived close to one are no more or less likely to attain a certificate than somebody who attended a community college. Yes? It's, yeah, so there's no observable, but it's just not significant. The coefficient's like. I mean, the coefficient isn't similar magnitude Yeah, so it blows up because, yeah, so the, the, you get very expanded variance because of the local average treatment effect, and so it's just kind of blowing up. We're not seeing anything in the IV estimates. We have statistically significant results. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's no, we're not seeing any evidence in the IV estimates. Um, okay, so then in the associate's degrees, um, we're again mostly not seeing um, uh, 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 statistical significance in most of our estimates. So again, similar to um, the uh, uh, 
certificates in most of our specifications, you know, some of them are kind of like brush up against statistical significance. They're mostly negative, but we're mostly just seeing no observable relationship between attending a for-profit and the probability of attending, uh, attaining an associate's degree, and then a dramatic reduction in the probability of attaining a bachelor's degree. So, uh, you know, the estimates ranging, to, you know, depending on the, all the different specifications we could do, around a 40% uh, reduction in the probability of getting a bachelor's degree if you started a, a for-profit institution as opposed to a, a, a community college. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the heterogeneity of this across various student types, but mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot of layers, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> questions about kind of aspirations, expectations. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how much this varies by students actually aspiring to get a BA. Yeah, it's, but you know, some proportion are going to and the, like the, the effect is negative, right? Do we have to, do we need to stratify the sample based on? I think the interesting thing is that, is that, that we're losing a bunch of people that wanted to do this or were people, um... well, they all wanted to. <laughs> if you ask them, 80% of high school graduates say they intend to get a bachelor's degree. Yeah, there's different expectations and aspirations. 80% of high school graduates say they intend to get a bachelor's degree. Well, what about by... And I believe every single one of them, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> what about by the type of program? Like, would community colleges say, but we're really good at graduating certain types of, like, to Joanne's example about nursing or these more... Well, it's... The, I mean, that's what the for-profits argue, is that we are better at graduation. That you're more likely, it's the exact argument that they make, you can see it in their advertising. You are more likely to graduate if you start with us than you start. The reason for paying $14,000 as opposed to $3,600 is because you're much more likely to get a certificate or an associate's. For our relevant group here, we see no evidence of that. But do you know if that would be the case for certain types of degrees? I don't know. So the marginal student is a uh, low information um, student who typically has very few educate can have very few educational resources at home. We um, defined our students as somebody like each of these is like that particular parent did not mother either a father or both parents. That particular student had uh, either one parent or both parents that never attended a single class, and that's relatively rare. That's a small proportion of the population, about thirty percent. Not that rare, but like thirty percent of the population for this group. So, and who lived closer to more for-profit. So it's there, you were kind of low information, you didn't know much about college, and you were induced to attend because you were living closer to more of these institutions. That's, that's what the, the local average treatment effect is, um, is that, that's the group that the local average treatment effect is estimating for. Come back, because I, I don't know the system that locks in here. Let's just say I started community college, and my rule was everybody who comes graduates. And I structured it so they all read it. Yeah. Who, who, is, who would prevent that from happening? Believe it or not, the faculty standing, standing athwart and saying no. Um. <laughs> I'm running it, running 100% of you being outside. So if you had a pure, like, so let's just say, if, you, if your intention was to set up a pure diploma mill, um, the accreditors would object because you didn't meet their process measures. And their process measures are students have to be in a class with, you know, with a certain amount of student contact hours and other stuff. So, and you need accreditation to get federal money, and these places run on federal money. Okay, so in our last five minutes, let me just show you the counterfactual, let's see, a, for, let's just look at the wage outcomes really quick. Stuff works the same, the first stage works the same for the wage outcomes as well. Um, but so now we're comparing with the other counterfactual, which is um, people who didn't attend. If you attended a for-profit, are you better off than somebody um, who didn't attend at all? Um, and this is, um, let's see, that's not right. Hold on. Where's my wage outcomes? Any college community? Oh, right. Okay, so I have to get my head around the different, how this works. Um, so let's compare for... Um, the, uh, the counterfactual, just on the right-hand side, the counterfactual uh, for no college. So you d the, these students do have, in the OLS estimates, they do have higher earnings than somebody who didn't attend college, um, about 11% um, higher. We're using uh, hourly uh, wages 
um, as the, uh, the measure of earnings here, um, log, log hourly wages. Um, in the instrumental variables estimates, um, we see it, it bounces around a substantial amount in most of the specifications. Um, we don't see a big difference. In a few, we do see some uh, marginal differences in terms of the impact on wages. So there is evidence in this that you get slightly higher earnings coming out of a community college um, if, than if you just didn't attend at all. Um, there's no evidence uh, that we can observe um, that if we compared it with community colleges or any colleges, uh, that the, the earnings are higher. Um, so it's the, you know, the uh, kind of coming back to that original question, any back of the envelope calculation on this, the amount of debt that you would take on to attend doesn't come close to being paid back by even like the most positive estimates we're getting here. Um, that your wages are a little bit higher, um, but not anywhere close to the debt that was accumulated um, in the course of a year or two at, at one of these institutions. So on that happy note, um, you know, the, uh, the poly the, we're not new to this. There's been a lot of studies. Our, I, we think that our contributions, though, are, first of all, just like more estimates. We just think it's important to, you know, have a substantial body of evidence in this area. There's, you know, the reason that we know so much and are able to do, we have so much policy on uh, the cost of higher education is because there's a lot of evidence supporting um, the impact of reducing the price. Um, we, uh, we think that the introduction of these multiple different distance measures, seeing how sensitive it is to different specifications around these distance measures, and then using multiple counterfactuals, which we didn't see in a lot of the other studies as a basis for comparison. We see those as our, our three primary contributions. You can tell me why I'm wrong in a second. Um, so, and I forgot to credit at the beginning Ben Skinner, who I worked with, you know, um, uh, jointly on this, this project. Anything you like about it is almost certainly due to him. Anything you don't is due to me. Um, and I'll take any other questions you have. I just want to ask a question, one other thing, and this is maybe, this is not necessarily for this work, but for, for Think Bus in the future. If you think about um, availabilities, I actually buy, a lot, a lot of this makes a lot of sense to me in, in the sense that these, these for-profits, their like, they're marketing is their huge thing. They target these, um, target people who they think are, could be convinced because they don't have other information, right? And they're not gonna know, have people to give them source of information to make the, you know, the kind of comparisons you might want them to make. Um, intensely competitive. But I also feel like when you know, you're measuring access in a, in a distance, like a physical distance, you know, so one of the things we saw, I, I realized a lot to what we did in, in looking at supplemental education yeah. classes where it just got flooded with nonprofit providers. And in the end, the ones that were really dominating were the online ones. They just could have massive amounts of kids serve, and their marketing was extremely aggressive. They used incentives, you know, and, and, and so a lot of the, as, as it got more competitive, and you could just see market shares going down, and that person's out, you know, going down, this one's out. and. I'm wondering if there's a way you could think about availability, access, bringing that group in. It might be a future research if you try to pursue it, but I feel like that is, is something that is, you know, you make it really even more accessible to people if you are, you know, don't have to leave your house. Right. Um, and, yes. yeah, so right. I don't know. I just, and they're good about the, you know, the compared to the time period we're talking about, the sophistication. If you also, if you search for a for-profit institution, they're among the most aggressive. So like Facebook will track that if you search for a for-profit institution, and then you will get served ads for for-profit institutions. Almost ex try it <laughs> exclusively um, uh, for the, the like the next two months. And so yeah, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Easy, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Josh, do you have a question? I, I was just thinking, like, towards that point, the Google Trends data is observable going back to this point. Oh, that's it's good. To, I think at least the MSA, but, like, lower than that, you wouldn't be able to get it at the level of the individual. Yeah, they're funky on their, their scales. They, like, they tell you if it's higher or lower than usual, but they don't tell you, they don't work on an absolute scale. Um, but it's worth trying, yeah. Because it's you can like, it's we we, we need it to be on a like a, a comparable absolute scale, like literally like number of searches, which they're not going to give you. But there might be something we can do with it. Just get the variation, yeah. Like the 
against that. Right. Yeah. If it's correlated, yeah, see if it's correlated, yeah. All right, we're right at four o'clock. Sorry, Laura, go ahead. <laughs>